So last time uh, we stopped uh, up until this page where we discuss basically the differences between structured or unstructured mesh uh, and when can you use it or why you need to use it. So for example, just to recap, um, for the same object, when you have uh, unstructured mesh, okay, when you impose the unstructured mesh, you can see that uh, the edges of the circle uh, is replicated or is um, uh, is being uh, meshed nicely. Okay? So it captures the, the curvature nicely. And uh, the, the main, uh, one of the main uh, importance or the comparison between structure and structure is in terms of the nodes, uh, the number of nodes that we generate. Um, since it can capture all the complex curvature, for example, in this case, the, uh, the circular edges, uh, you can see that the number of elements okay, uh, that correspond to the uh, unstructured grid is about 11,000 compared to the elements for the structured grid. So uh, the accuracy uh, in terms of uh, capturing the object's geometry, the complex geometry, is better for unstructured, but it comes, uh, the, it's not to control backs, but it comes uh, with the, the numbers of uh, higher elements required. Okay. Uh, this, but in turn, we translate to hopefully a better accuracy uh, because when we have a larger elements and nodes, uh, computation can be done at a smaller interval, hence uh, they should provide or should give a better output for our simulation. Okay, so that's what we uh, covered last time. All right. So. Let's continue our lesson. Okay, so we have a simple shape over here. So the question here is how can you improve this mesh quality? Okay, uh, so we have a, a simple object, a simple shape. The question is okay, how can you propose what can be done to improve the meshing? Okay, assuming that the important location uh, for this particular object uh, or the uh, area of interest. Uh, for example, the first one is over here, and the second one is over here. Okay. All right. So, um, these two uh, basically are the examples of the things or uh, the steps that can be done to improve the mesh. For example, at the area of uh, the interest, the first one, where you have a hole. Okay. So, Assuming that you are looking at the influence of the hole uh, on the cantilever or on this particular shape, for example, then you need to have a refined uh, mesh around the area of interest, which is the hole, the first one. Okay. So how can you do this, basically? Uh, so assuming that this is the general mesh generated by using the uh, global machine. Remember last time when we uh, covered about global and refined uh, localized mesh? So global means uh, you set a general value uh, on uh, the software, on the uh, NCS GUI, and you are going to get a mesh distribu distribution that is almost the same for the rest of the geometry or the domain. Okay. But over here, okay, because we have an area of interest uh, around the pool, then we need to increase uh, the, mesh, uh, the mesh refinement or we need to increase the mesh quality. So we can do that by using the localized uh, setting, localized uh, mesh setting. Okay, so you can either set the face or the edges of the hole to get this particular uh, mesh uh, setting. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you want to increase the uh, mesh quality around this particular connector, for example, the, let's uh, say for a connection between uh, this side and this side. So, you again, you use localized meshing, you need to increase the quality or the number of mesh okay, by using a smaller grid size okay, in this particular, particular area. Okay. So, when you compute, when the calculation is done, then you are going to get a better output for the area of interest. Okay. For, for example, this is an enhancement of the mesh uh, for the hole, and this is for the uh, connector. Okay. All right. So similarly, uh, 
this is not CFD. I think this is from uh, FEA, but the point is uh, the same. Uh, we are going to discuss about the mesh. So if you have a mesh, something like this, and the maximum value is shown uh, in terms of percentage over here. Okay. And uh, if, let's say this corner here is your area of interest. So the one application that I can think of is in terms of pipe flow, for example, okay. or maybe stress uh, distribution on, uh, on the sharp edges. So, for example, when you're dealing with uh, elbow uh, in the pipe, so that's where the pressure drop happens. Okay, or in this case, if you want to look at the FEA of the sharp edges or sharp corners, uh, if you're you just want to focus on this particular area, you want to make sure that failure doesn't happen here. So, how can you improve this? Uh, do you think the mesh over here should be should be sufficient to capture the the problem? Or do you think it can be improved? Okay, so if we have a look on the right side here, you can see that we have a more uniform mesh generated for this particular the same problem. Okay, and you can see that if to increase mesh elements in around the same area, you are going to get a better color distribution. Okay, because remember, uh, when you have a smaller mesh, what will happen is that you are going to have more calculation done on the elements or the nodes. It means that at each particular interval, the smaller interval, uh, you are going to get a calculation done uh, on the smaller interval. Hence, when they combine uh, producing this color contour, you're going to get a more refined or a more nicely generated uniform uh, contour. Okay? So this is an example of uh, for the corner or sharp edges okay, if you have if you have any problem. So pay particular um, particular attention uh, for that uh, sharp edges or corners. Usually that's the place where your mesh skewness will be the highest. So in this case, they are just using unstructured, uh, sorry, they are using structured grid. So you can see that the mesh is uniform, so there shouldn't be any problem. But if you plan to use unstructured grid, usually you will have problems if your mesh is not refined enough. For example, if you are using uh, unstructured grid on the left side here, um, you need to check the skewness, okay, whether the shape is being captured or replicated uh, properly by the mesh. Okay. All right. So uh, in this example, it's just to show basically if you have an object, you can use a combination of several mesh methods. We discussed this before. And we know so far we have unstructured, structured, we have curvilinear, for example. Uh, over here, for example, you have a structured grid and then a, a structured grid again in the middle, and you have a curvilinear grid. It's curvilinear means it's uh, kind of like structured grid, but it's it has a curve. Okay? So it's not unstructured grid or triangular grid. For example, uh, unstructured grid usually uh, uses the triangular shape. Or triangle, okay. but curvilinear is basically an adaptation adaptation of the structured grid. So, for example, if you look over here, it's kind of like a, a structured grid, but uh, there is a curve uh, imposed on it. Okay, so you can use this uh, a combination of it. And if you remember last time, okay, if you can just highlight this area, we covered about mesh conformal or conformality or mesh topology. Uh, which means the importance of having uh, the mesh face touching uh, from one section to another section or one domain to another domain. So if you can look over here, the mesh face is being nicely met okay, from one side to another side. And this is what we want. Okay, remember, uh, the interface basically signifies the transfer of information. Remember, it's, uh, everything is about calculation mathematics. So if you do not have a nice face, what are you going to get? A uh, micro, sorry, not a uh, nice face, nice interface. What you're going to have is a problem when transferring. First, you're going to get an error because the mesh uh, basically uh, cannot detect the conformality or the shape topology. And secondly, because of the error, you will not be able to proceed to calculation. Okay. So you have to solve the error first, and the error mostly when you have several domains will be due to the 
interface, uh, the, the, connect, uh, the connectivity at the interface. So for example, you can see over here, even though you have structured and curvilinear grid, you can see that the faces of the cells, they are uh, basically generated, uh, they are conformal or the topology is nicely met. Okay? So the interface is very, very important. Okay? So just keep in mind. So similarly, if you have structured grid, I think that's quite um, quite straightforward. Uh, structured grid is, for example, okay, you have something like this. They are just going to find the closest mesh uh, from one another. Okay, similarly, what we have over here, okay, structured. Okay, you can see that the interface, they are nicely uh, generated okay, from one domain to another domain. Okay, similarly, uh, you can have a mix of adaptive mesh plus structured, plus unstructured. So this is what we have for figure 15, uh, 14. Okay. So you have structured mesh over here, okay, or more like a curvilinear uh, mesh. Then you have unstructured in the middle, but as you can see here, okay, I cannot zoom uh, the figures, but the interface between the structured grid from the yellow side to the uh, purple side, they are met okay, properly. Okay. So all these, Okay, refers to the mesh conform, uh, conformal. Okay. Similarly, from unstructured, from purple to the blue side, you have conformal in the area of uh, or the interface area. Okay. So this is what you need to change. So for example, when you have a complex object and you have uh, generated the mesh, but you keep on getting error in terms of skewness or error in generating the mesh itself, look at the interface that's one thing and also look at the uh, location where the comp uh, complex edges are usually you have, when you have an elbow sharp elbow or sharp corners that's where the main source of errors or problems are coming from okay All right okay all right so uh, okay, what we have over here, for example, from this figure, A and B, uh, when you have uh, sharp edges uh, for, for your object, okay, if you can see this object, for example, when they zoom in, and when you look at the, um, at the end of the edges, instead of having the sharp edges, now the user basically have the options to chop off or cut off or round off basically the edges if it is not important to your observation or your uh, investigation. Okay? Because as I said, the main problem uh, in meshing usually when it involves compact shapes, and compact shapes doesn't mean when you have several combinations of uh, parts or objects, no. It can be the sharp corners or the edges uh, that you have. Okay? So for example, if these corners, okay, the one that is highlighted over here, if it is not important uh, for your study, okay, but you want to have some resemblance of the general shape, you can just round, round the shape off, okay? chop off. Either you use chamfer or maybe you just use the filling just to make it smooth. Then it should improve your mesh quality. Okay, so that's one option. Uh, and then in NCIS itself, uh, when you did your first lab, uh, hopefully you realize uh, you have the options basically apart from the automatic uh, or default setting you have the options to select um, the elements uh, what type of elements you want to use for your mesh generation uh, among the frequently used elements we have hexahedron over here hexa means you have six faces and we have prism which means you have five faces five face uh, faces and you have tetrahedron okay Shapes like uh, with a shape like this, with uh, your uh, number of face n equals to four. Okay, um, so if you ask me, what uh, type of element is suitable? Uh, I cannot answer that because it depends first on the experience, and it depends also on the applications that you are doing. Uh, for example, if you are doing, for example, I give you a very simple uh, example. If you are doing a uh, simulation of an air conditioner, uh, aircon HVAC, the flow of HVAC in a room, for example. So the room can be modeled simply as 
something like this. Just a square box or a, a, a rectangular box. So in this case, probably the best element to be used is hexahedron. Because can be done quickly and it doesn't have to capture any uh, complex shapes. But if you're doing something like uh, I showed you before, uh, my research uh, is about the uh, tidal, okay? uh, you have to capture the geometry of the coastline, then probably hexahedral is not the best element to be used. Okay? Probably you need to use prism or tetrahedral okay? to capture the complex coastline okay? because coastline is not straight or it's not square. Okay, you have angles, uh, you have a curvature. So it depends on the problems uh, at your hand. Okay? So you have to decide that for yourself. All right. Okay, uh, so can I just give you about one or two minutes just to brainstorm by yourself uh, the advantages and disadvantages for both structured and structured bridge. Okay, after one minute, we're going to uh, have a short discussion. All right, so one minute from now. Okay, so what do you have basically uh, for structured and unstructured bricks? All right, so hopefully you will have something like this. Okay, just um, the, let's go quickly. Uh, I think by now, hopefully, you can understand on the pros and cons by using these two mesh setup. So for structured grid, for example, you have regular connectivity between its element and the neighborhood relationships are defined by the pattern function. So what does it mean is uh, previously, when you have uh, a structured grid, the elements is easier to, to be generated and the conformer is almost guaranteed for a simple shape. Okay? because it doesn't have to uh, change the shape much for the structure grid. Uh, it's, and it's also robust and more faster compared to the unstructured grid and better accuracy because uh, you can see here, for example, a simple box over here, and you have lines like this, for example. Okay, so better accuracy because you have a better alignment, meaning that the convergence wouldn't be a problem, okay, because they can move from one element to the elements quickly. But if you have an unstructured grid, for example, okay, because of the geometries, the complex geometries, uh, and for example, if you have something like this, for example, okay, you can see that the transfer of information from one element to the next element is not straightforward. Okay. Sometimes you might need to go down, sometimes you might need to go right, sometimes there is an angle involved. So the computation needs to decide okay, which is the optimal path basically to go to transfer the information from element one, for example, to element two or three. Okay. So there is a additional work okay, uh, in a simple term, additional work being needed uh, to convert the information from one source to another source. But for the structure, for example, the transfer of information is very straightforward. Okay? Uh, basically, the, the algorithm already uh, knows that, okay, you have a structure grid. Okay? Your grid will always be from, for example, this is, for example, just five by five. We have five elements by five elements. So they know, okay, let's finish the first row and then second row, third row, and so on and so forth, so, such, uh, for example. So it's better uh, uh, the accuracy is better for structure okay, because of the alignment. And because of the better accuracy, better alignment, and faster convergence, basically, you're going to need less computational memory and time required, So, which is memory efficiency. Compared to the unstructured, because it needs additional um, work. So work uh, in the... Uh, in CFD or in computational language, numerical modeling, work, okay, additional work can be translated into uh, basically the time required, the time, and also the source or resources, you know, resources basically. 
is basically your computer. Okay. So if you have a supercomputer, then there should be a problem. But for example, if you are using uh, your laptop to run your simulation, there you will notice. Okay. Um, you are going to need, for example, uh, more sources or the burden on the your, your graphic cards, for example, will be higher okay, if you use unstructured grid. Okay. So less computational memory. I think this is the most relevant part, okay, and also for this one. Okay. Accurate and it requires less computational uh, memory. Okay, but disadvantages, okay, low grid quality. This is especially true for complex shapes. Okay. For complex shapes, this will be a problem. And uh Okay, similarly, this is a uh, reverse of a complex. Basically, it means when you have angle and curve geometries. All right. Okay, I'm going to show you an example. What does it mean by stair stepping uh, later on after this? For unstructured grid, similarly, okay, uh, faster grid generation, okay, uh, able to handle complex geometry, of course, because it's quite flexible. It's quite powerful, actually. Uh, straightforward operation of mesh topology. Okay, this is all the elements that we discussed before. But the disadvantages is greater memory requirement, again, refers to the resources, slower to solve because you need more work okay, to decide the path or the optimal path. Okay? So that's, I think, uh, the gist or the, the thing that you need to understand between structure and unstructured grid. Okay, a step stepping this down. The problem if you use structured grid. Okay, so again, the any figures with the purple uh, lines basically refers to the work that was done by myself or by my students. Okay, so this is for my thesis, for example, it shows the difference. For example, if you use a sigma layer, sigma layers basically is uh, an adaptation of the uh, structured grid. Okay, so you can see that it's almost similar to a structured grid, okay, but we have a curve. Uh, adapt to the shape, okay? kind of like curvy learning. Okay? So it captures the shape like this, okay, for example. But if you use another adaptation of structured grid, okay, this, as you can see at the top, okay, this is structured grid. So for for example, this is a hill. Okay? Uh, what I'm looking at is basically at the bottom of the uh, the ocean. So when you have a, a bathymetry, okay? bathymetry refers to the topology uh, of the ocean. Okay, What happens on the uh, ocean bed? So if you want to capture this option, uh, this particular shape, okay, if you use structured grid uh, in the terms of Z coordinate layer, you have no problems to capture the problem uh, on the top here. But if you use this particular Z coordinate layer, you are going to have staircase problem. Remember, uh, the mesh, the structured grid is trying to capture the shape, the complex shape as much as possible. Okay, But by doing so, what it is doing is basically just have a staircase. Okay, you have one staircase, two, three, and four. Okay, so you have already uh, a nicely generated mesh over here, but some, some, suddenly you are going to have half of the mesh element and then a smaller one, which now instead of structured, it is skewed. So this is an example of stair, staircase or skewed uh, structured grid. So this is the problem when you try to capture complex shape. This is not even complex, but just to give you an example, when you try to capture complex geometry by using the stack, uh, the structure grid. Okay. So similarly, uh, when you have an object something like this, okay, uh, in this object, what uh, I was trying to do is basic, basically, this is the object or the notes that I received from the original document. So basically, in order for me to, to create a mesh, okay, I have to create uh, my mesh manually, okay, not using auto, uh, I do not have the function to generate mesh automatically for my software. So to do that, when I extract this information uh, from the database, okay, the, this, is, this refers to the notes. Huh? So I have a shape, this is uh, a small island, the shapes or the distribution of the nodes are quite scattered. You can see over here. 
So what does it mean? What does it imply? What is the implication of the nodes distribution like this? Okay. So uh, before I go into detail, so this is what happens after I have made a, a, a procedure that is called resampling, meaning that I rearrange the nodes that I have on my object. So from here, from the original position or from the original nodes, now we have a more evenly distributed nodes uh, for this particular geometry. Okay, now let's see the impact of the nodes. So these are the example of the mesh generated by using original geometry, in this case, on the left side. Okay, that's not exactly the same, but this is by using original geometry from the database that I got. And the second one is by using uh, mesh that has been uh, resampled, meaning that the nodes has been resampled or distributed evenly. Okay. So you can see for the first one, for the original mesh, okay, when I use the original database or original points, what I have is uneven concentration on the coastline okay, on my geometry. Okay. That, does it mean, uh, is it bad or is it good or does it really matter actually for your for your work? So again, it depends. So for example, over here, we can see that the concentration is not uh, even. So for example, we have, uh, okay, mesh generation over here and then suddenly we have a concentration. So the dark blue refers to the higher concentration of mesh. Okay, so we have a higher concentration here. So let me just, Highlight so a higher concentration in this area, and then again in this area, and then again around this coastline. Okay, now if you look at the second one for this part, part for part B, after I have rearranged the nodes, my distributed doesn't have any uneven distributed uh, distribution, meaning that the concentration of mesh from the start until the end for my geometry. They are all the same. Okay, so as you can see here, the, the uh, arrangement or the nodes distributions for this resample, the resample product or geometry is even, meaning that you have an even spacing between one node to another node. Okay, why does it matter? It matters. It reflects back to the uh, to the drawbacks of the unstructured grid. Okay, so if we quickly go back, uh, it goes back to this particular problem. Greater memory requirement and slower to solve. Okay, why? Um, just to highlight, the coastline here, even though it is important, but this is not my main uh, area of interest. My main area of interest is located, uh, there should be a larger area, but it should be somewhere around here. Okay. So if we use the original mesh, this is original mesh, what will happen is that I'm going to have four, uh, a, num a large number of mesh that is not being utilized efficiently. Okay. So just by looking by uh, my naked eye, you can basically see that the number of elements, elements, for A is basically larger than B okay, because of this uneven concentration. Okay, when you have a larger number of elements, it means you need more computational resources. And this can be translated into more time needed to compute your problem. Okay? And remember, what you are doing right now is uh, looking at a simple problem. In my case, uh, instead of just looking at a 2D problem, I'm looking at a three-dimensional problem, meaning that I'm interested to look at what is happening from the surface until the bottom uh, of the ocean. So I have layers that is basically being sliced between the bottom and the top. So the layers can be, if one layer, basically you have just surface and the the back, uh, the back uh, of the ocean. But in my case, I'm interested to see what is happening every five meters or every 10 meters 
um, uh, in between the, the flow. So I have to create several planes or several layers in my domain. So instead of having just one domain, uh, one layer, I have 10 or maybe 20 layers. So that, just imagine if you have, uh, let's say 1,000 elements, just a simple uh, example. If you have 1,000 elements on the first layer, and now if you have 10 layers, so 1,000 elements multiplied by 10 layers, you're going to have a minimum of 10,000 elements. That is if you have a simple geometry. But in my case, uh, it can, uh, the, I think the number of elements for 10 or maybe 20 layers that, uh, that I use for my study, I think it was about, I think about 500,000, 600,000 elements. And I require the use of a cluster computer, uh, meaning that uh, it's not up until the supercomputer, but uh, a pool of computers that is being combined together to use the resources. So as you can see here, the, the mesh distribution is as important as the, the generation itself. Okay? You want your mesh to be distributed nicely okay, along the geometries that you uh, that you have. All right. Okay. Okay. So before we go to boundary conditions, uh, let's take a five minutes break and we'll continue later uh, after that. Okay. So we covered about mesh and now let's proceed to the boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, so as has been uh, emphasized over and over again uh, over the course of this um, lecture, uh, time spent generating a group grid is time well spent. So if you want to have a reliable or your output is satisfactory, spend time for your mesh. Okay. But apart from that, you also need to specify the boundary conditions for your problem. Okay. So uh, over here it says uh, you need to apply appropriate boundary conditions as required in order to obtain accurate CMD solutions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the boundary conditions must be carefully uh, applied at all boundaries. Okay, so let's discuss what, what does it mean by a boundary and how can we apply or the setting that can we use. Okay. All right. Um, so, the simplest boundary condition okay, is basically just a wall. Okay. Uh, since the fluid cannot pass through a wall, the normal component of the velocity is set to zero relative to the wall. Okay. Uh, so meaning that at the wall, the velocity can be set as zero. Okay. But you can see that from the options available in MCs, uh, we have several options to set uh, the boundary. Okay. For example, this is an example that we have uh, for, for your second lab, basically. Okay. So we have an, uh, a domain over here. This is a schematic diagram. So this is the... Uh, uh, the front face, okay. Okay, so basically you are facing forward, and this is from the side view, okay. So front view, and this is a side view. So you have an object. So this is a turbine, basically, this is an object um, specified basically at the location in the domain. Okay, so uh, assuming that this object, or in this case, a tidal turbine, is located in a channel, okay. So let's say this is the isometric view of your domain. So if it is in a channel, a channel, what it means is basically just a, a flume or a basin okay, that has a water flowing. Okay, so you can specify, basically, uh, we know that this is the bottom. Okay, so the uh, fluid is bounded by the walls on the left and right side okay, of the domain. So you can specify this is to be the solid wall. Then, of course, we need to specify the inlet and outlet of your domain. So you can specify the flow is coming from this direction and exit at this direction, at this location. Okay. And you can have a top wall. Okay. So you can specify whether it's going to be enclosed flow or is it going to be free surface. So if you're going to decide that for your configuration, uh, the flow passing through an object okay, for this particular problem, for example, you have a free surface, meaning that you have an interaction between air okay, and also, of course, inside the flume or inside this channel, you have water. Okay. So 
If you decide to have that interaction, then just leave the top wall uh, as a free surface. Okay, do not need to specify as any outlet. Okay, and from the first step, I think uh, uh, you have the options. You can see that you have the option to specify uh, what um, are the setting that uh, you want for the walls. Okay, for example, over here. Uh, you can either uh, set the setting to be the walls eh, to be no slip condition okay or you can use shear for example okay what does it mean by no slip condition uh, okay this is among common mistakes uh, by the students and even uh, several uh, of my students um, uh, etc okay no slip condition okay, the, the term here no slip condition most of the students uh, confuse this by thinking that no slip meaning that you have no friction okay uh, in actuality no slip okay so for example if you have bottom like this for example okay you decide this is to be your wall for example and you specify or you choose your option to be no slip condition but you will notice you're still going to get the velocity reduction at the bottom something like this okay you have zero uh, velocity at the bottom because of the interaction between the wall or the bed bottom bed and also uh, the fluid okay why does it happen so just to keep in mind no slip condition for the materials that you choose for the wall for example for any materials that you choose there is still a friction okay so friction still exists between the wall and also the flow. Hence, you are going to get zero uh, value. Okay? You're going to get a zero uh, value for whatever variables that you're calculating. Okay? So, I think, for example, let's have a look over here. Okay? So, in this case, uh, we have a channel. This is from the top view. In the channel here, okay, you have the wall. From the right and left side you can see that there is some uh, the velocity over here if you look at the legend here it's almost zero okay at the interface of the wall okay this is because students choose no slip condition okay? no slip condition means there is still a friction okay? it doesn't mean that then there is a smooth a flow going between the flow and the interface. Okay, the friction is still there. Okay, so just keep in mind. Okay, how about shear setting? Okay. If you want a smooth, uh, your flow to be smooth, meaning that there is no interaction between your wall and the flow, what you need to do is you need to set. For example, uh, assuming that this is your left wall and this is right wall. This phenomena happens when you have uh, no slip condition. Okay. Right. But if you want to get something like this, okay, meaning that you have a smooth flow, no interaction between your wall and also your flow, you need to set your shear stress, your shear equals to zero. If you set your shear equals to zero, then you are going to get your smooth interaction similar to what you have uh, you, uh, you notice over here. Okay, all right. Okay. So that's the key difference between no slip and shear. Okay, shear, which you, know, you choose option shear, but if you choose shear, you set everything equals to zero, then it will be a smooth uh, transaction. Okay, so wall boundary conditions are used to bound fluid and solid region, okay, as shown over here. Uh, in fluid dynamics, the no slip condition for viscous uh, fluids assume that at solid boundary, fluid will have zero velocity. Okay, so interaction is still happening, friction is still happening. So you have zero velocity relative to the boundary. Okay, all right. So again, this is the examples. That you're going to see for your second lab. Um, you need to specify the walls we discussed before. Let's say this is your left wall, right wall. You specify your inlet. Top wall can be just free surface. 
if, if this is air, okay, air, then we have the outlet over here. Okay. So you can see that here, if you use the no slip condition, your velocity at the bottom will be zero because of the friction. Okay, and V equals to zero. All right, so okay, that's about the bond conditions. Okay. That's about the wall. So now let's discuss about the inlet and the outlet. So inlet and the outlet, probably the two main boundaries that you need to set uh, for your domain. Okay, so we have several options for the boundaries. Okay. Uh, when we are talking about CFD, so we assume we have flow coming in from the inlet. Okay, and then it leaves uh, for the outlet. Okay, so you can either specify your inlet to be in terms of the velocity, okay, or pressure. So you have several options. Okay, but commonly we are going to use velocity. Okay, for example, you know that you have an inflow, okay, free stream velocity, let's say one meter per second. But you do not know what is the velocity at the outlet. So for the outlet, okay, when you impose velocity for the inlet, you want to set your outlet to use something different than the velocity. Okay? You want usually will use velocity for the inlet and pressure for the outlet. Okay, why? Okay, usually, first we do not know the velocity going out. That's one thing. Secondly, if you set the velocity going out, you, let's say you set a value, you know uh, the, velo the velocity coming in is one meter per second. And then you also set the velocity at uh, outlet to be, let's say 0 0.5 meter per second. So what will happen is, you are going to over constraint. Uh, remember, um, I think in CAT or in, uh, when you're doing 3D modeling, uh, the term over constraint, when you over define your problem, then you are going to have an error. Okay? So when you define the outlet as velocity, okay, when you already have velocity for your inlet, you are going to over constrain your domain, then you have a computational problem at the back. So most of the time, you are going to get error. That's fine. Secondly, you are going to get backflow. Okay, what is backflow? Backflow means Instead of the flow going out of the domain, now the flow is going to be returned. Okay, meaning that it cannot pass through the outlet. It's being returned or pushed back into the domain. Okay, so hence it will disrupt uh, whatever calculation or it will disrupt what you want to examine or explore in the domain. Okay, so for example, in this particular problem, you have several objects uh, which is located on the bottom and you want to see what is happening uh, uh, for the flow over the object. Okay. So most probably you want to see the wick or the flow behind the object, okay, behind it. If you have flow that is being blow back or being written back, then the flow generated here will be disturbed. Hence, you cannot properly examine the flow. Okay, so you want to set something that allows the fluid, the fluid or the flow to move out of the domain. Okay, so in this case, uh, you have velocity as the inlet. Okay, so you can see here, wind power law 0 0.3. So this is velocity inlet. And you have power, uh, pressure, yeah, pressure for the outlet. And for upper boundary, it is symmetry. So they set, uh, they, uh, set the shear slip to be zero. And then you have floor, which is a no slip condition. Okay. Uh, and then you have sides, which use slip equals to zero. Right. Okay. Uh, so this is regarding CFD. But sometimes you need uh, to look or to study problems regarding heat transfer. So, for example, you have an object in the middle, you want to see the heat transfer between the flow and the object in the middle here. So you specify your temperature over here, V1, 
and we need to specify this to be again. You cannot specify temperature as well because you want to estimate the heat transfer. If you have heat in, your heat out, if the temperature of the body is higher, you expect your T2 at the outlet to be higher. But if you impose T2, then you already over constrain your domain. You cannot get what is the um, heat being transferred out of the system. So usually you have to specify the pressure. Okay, so it has to be different from the inlet and the uh, outlet. Okay, more importantly, if you are dealing with temperature, you want to activate the energy or turbulence equations. Okay, so you need to set in assist to enable energy or turbulence equations uh, in order for you to check or to study the temperature variation. Okay, if you just want to look at the pressure or velocity, then you do not need to enable the energy equations. Okay. Uh, okay, so we discussed this about over constraint. Okay, so make sure when you have uh, inlet uh, as a velocity, your outlet needs to be uh, other than uh, your, uh, it's not the same as your inlet. Okay, so we studied about the mesh, we look at the um, boundaries, the wall, slip, no slip, shear, and then uh, we look at the inlet and outlet. So the next question is, how big should your boundary be? Okay. For example, uh, this is a, a hatchback system. Okay. So for hatchback system, I think it should be relatively easy or straightforward. If you are dealing with something that is obvious, for example, you know the entrance of the inlet and you know the, uh, the exit or the outlet of that particular problem. So, for example, uh, for hatchback, you know the location of your in and you know the location of your out, meaning that you know the dimension of your problem. So, that's straightforward. Similarly, for heat transfer, uh, so for heat exchanger, you know this is where your flow uh, going in and this is your flow going out. So, you know the exact location of in and out. So, but what happens if you are not sure of the length of the output flow or the weight generated? So, for example, this is the simulation for, I think this is for exhaust, probably for motorcycle. For example, we are not sure uh, how far will the exhaust, the particle, the flow will move from the from the exit of the uh, exhaust pipe into the domain. So you are not sure of that. So how big should your length or should your domain be? Okay. Okay, another one, um, for example, for a nozzle. Okay. Let's say you have, uh, you know the pressure, for example, is a high pressure nozzle. Okay. You want to see how far can the uh, flow goes to basically. Okay, so the question is, how do you know to stop your domain to be here and not just extending the domain to be further out? So that's the question that we are going to try to look at in the next couple of slides. Okay, okay. Um, so, so briefly uh, about symmetry. Uh, so this has been covered in lab one. So basically symmetry boundary, hopefully uh, we understand by now, it's a boundary condition that is imposed on the face uh, so that the flow across the face is a mirror image. So if you have some text symmetry, you can just uh, use the geometry, uh, the half of the geometry in order to uh, to do the simulation. Okay. Um, so I think the important part here for any symmetry boundary, you need to choose the axis, the right axis. Okay. Otherwise, if you use the wrong axis, where for example, uh, you have angle, for example, then it can no longer be a symmetry uh, output okay? because the value will be different. Okay? So symmetry, anything that is symmetry, you can just do half of the calculations and then the output should be the same on both half. Okay? All right. Okay, so the, uh, the discussion why we use symmetry boundary, 
I think hopefully it's obvious by now. Uh, first, first, because we can, basically because uh, the object itself is symmetry. Okay. The second one, the more important uh, reason is because to reduce computational resources. Computational power, I write down computational power. Uh, power might not be the correct terms, resources. Okay, so instead of doing a complete peak exchanger, okay, you can just use a symmetry design and you're going to see the same behavior or the same phenomena for the both symmetry and also for the complete object. Okay, so for example, this is what you did for your first lab. Okay, uh, half pipe, okay, you should see similar uh, output on both ends. Okay, this is for example your domain, your second half should be the same. Similarly, okay, for car, for example, you want to see the drag or the flow passing through a car. Why does it mean what does it mean by computer resources? For simple objects like this, I think that's that should be okay. But if you have a complex object like car, for example, if you have a um, number of elements, maybe 500,000, 200,000, okay, instead of having both half, okay, just imagine, imagine you have an object with a mesh element of, let's say, just 100,000 elements, just a simple example. If you want to compute or if you want to do both instead of doing symmetry boundary, now you instead of 100 you are going to have another one here 100k so in total you are dealing with 200,000 elements 200,000 elements for example definitely will require more computational resources so almost double okay uh, for those who still do not understand okay what does it mean by computational resources okay uh, the easiest example is if you have a laptop just open as many applications that you can. Let's say maybe you open Chrome uh, browser, 20 Chrome browsers with 20 or 30 tabs each. And then you open YouTube and then you open uh, Google Classroom, maybe some apps, Spotify, uh, and then NCS, for example. On top of that, you have Google Chrome, then plus NCS, PowerPoint, Words, open at the same time. Even by using uh, uh, gaming spec computer, you will notice that after you open all apps at one time, the response okay, will be slower. Okay. So that's because your resources, the, the CPU, the processing unit of your computer is now doing multitasking okay, for so many uh, tasks. Okay. And different tasks require different resources. For example, and this is quite heavy, hence maybe 70% of the uh, resources is being allocated to NCS. Okay, So you only have 30% uh, of the remaining power to do something else. Okay? So that's what it is meant by computational resources. Okay? The capability of your device to compute or to do work, multitasking. Okay, uh, So it's not the same as RAM. RAM definitely helps to speed up the process. But resources itself is different. Okay. So uh, we discuss about mesh and then the boundaries, wall setting, and then we discuss about domain. So uh, did we cover about how big the domain should be? Okay. Uh, we did not cover that yet, but it will be covered in the next uh, slides that I have. Okay, so that's KID for now for the uh, for the domain size. Okay, but so far, uh, basically what we have covered in this lecture, all in all, if you just have understanding on the theory, but not on the uh, practical side, it will be difficult. So that's why uh, we move our 
a lecture on ANSYS procedures to be at the start of the semester instead of at the end. And then we coupled it with the first and the second lab and of, of course the uh, case study to help students get understanding uh, what we learned in the class is now being applied in the lab to see the differences or the, the importance of the settings that we just discussed. So you need to practice. Okay? That's why lab one and lab two, they are very, very important because it will be used for case study. I emphasize this over and over again. So get some practice. Uh, maybe you do not need to wait until week eight or week 10 to start with the case study. I haven't set the due date, but it will be after the uh, first test, roughly about week eight or week nine. So get started from now, find your materials, uh, start doing the meshing, for example, start doing the geometry, get some feel, get some idea of what you want to do. Then you repeat the process over and over again, then you will be uh, get better in uh, CFD. Okay, all right. So, so the next one, we are going to have a look at the sample of case study, which will cover, of course, uh, the question about the size of the domain. Okay, so on and all, we finished about the introduction to CFD, but we still uh, on this uh, section, which is the hands-on or detailed applications on the theory as well as the basis. Okay. So let's talk for one or two minutes and we are going to continue our lecture with the case study for ANSYS problem. Thank you. Continue. All right. Thank you for all the questions. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go too in detail some of it uh, because we already covered this in uh, the lab. So basically just to highlight a few case, uh, case study, which I think is relevant to our course. Uh, first of all, is of course the mesh again you will encounter uh, mesh problems over and over again so in this particular problem we have pipe flow entrance region for redox symbol of 500 and they're using a symmetry boundary you have three options of mesh uh, the first one is very very coarse means uh, you have 40 multiplied by 8 so equals to 320 elements the second one is just a medium 1200 elements and the next one is medium or slightly refined, roughly about 5,000 elements. Okay. So what we want to have a look here is the influence of the mesh size. Okay. Don't uh, worry about the graph, just pay attention for this particular diagram. Okay. So when you have several options, so this is what we call as convergence study or mesh, uh, mesh comparative study. We want to check whether the mesh have an influence uh, on our project or problem. So we have very, very cost where the number of cells uh, were, was only 220 elements. Uh, we have coarse, medium, fine, until ultra fine. So you can see the difference between 320 to 300,000 elements. Okay. But what is more important is here, the corresponding pressure from this particular problem. You can see that for the coarse or very, very coarse uh, element, the pressure difference or the pressure calculated uh, was about 4.4 Pascal. But for the highest refinement, you are going to get 4.035. You can see there is a difference of almost 0 0.4 Pascal. This is significant. Okay? If your interest is definitely pressure, for example, you want to look at the pressure drop or of a boiler, for example, okay? Any difference in the value that you calculated or you computed uh, in your uh, simulation is important because it will reflect, reflect on the design of the boiler, okay? So 0.4 here is significant. So you can see that if you use a very, very coarse grid compared to ultra fine, the number of elements, of course, is uh, they're much, much different. It has an influence on the output calculated or generated by the software. Okay, so that's very, very critical. Okay, and similarly, if you look over here in terms of, I think this is the normalized axial velocity contours. Uh, 
it is plotted in terms of the lines. Eh? Okay. For varicose, you only have 40 multiplied by 8 elements okay, compared to 5, 3, 20 multiplied by 64. You can see that the contour generated, this is velocity contour eh, in terms of line. You can see that the difference in terms of the shape here. Okay. See how the shape is more curved or moved towards the back for the uh, refined grid compared to the very coarse where you have a straightforward values. Okay. So just to highlight again, again, over and over again, mesh is very, very important. Okay. Uh, and then some students might ask, okay, then what is the best element to be used? Or what is the number best number of elements to be used? I cannot can I can cannot possibly say any random number. No. It depends on the problems. Okay. Sometimes it depends on the problem, sometimes it depends on the resources that you have, computational resources. If you're using supercomputer, then that means uh, computational resources might not be a problem for you. So you can pretty much use any uh, mesh size, the smallest mesh size possible. But if your resources are, are limited, then you need to balance between accuracy and also uh, refinement. Okay, All right. Okay, so as, uh, again, an example of flow around a circular cylinder. Okay, so you have a computational domain sim something similar to this. Okay. Now, um, this is for medium. Uh, I think this is cost okay, 80 multiplied by 60. And for fine, okay, is the elements number of uh, are increased, as you can see here, is highly refined okay, compared to the one here. And this is being reflected on the streamline. Okay. You can see that there is a difference in terms of the wake formation. And if you remember, what is the phenomena behind the object? If you remember from our lesson, okay. this is weak, okay, but not quite the von Karman. Uh, remember von Karman vortex, which we covered uh, briefly last time. So anything that is behind an object, this is what we call weak. So the weak formation is different between coarse, medium, and also highly refined. Okay, so this will have an influence. If, for example, we want to look at the influence of the size of an object for object, let's say you have another object behind here. So the weight generation is different for this mesh selection. Okay. So it will give a different output. So that's why it depends on the part, any particular problems and also your uh, resources. Okay, so... Remember the question previously, how big should your, uh, should your boundaries be? Um, something that you have and um, you have the value of uh, the dimension. Okay? You know the dimension you have. This is in, you know this is the inlet. Something like this is easy per se because you can just design your uh, application based on the dimension given. Okay? But what if you have no idea the extent of the flow for that particular problem or applications. For example, something like this uh, we discussed before. Okay. Is it okay for your domain to just end over here? Or should it be extended further? Similarly, for the nozzle, should it be longer or should it be just up until this point? Maybe because this is the dimension required. For example, maybe the length specified by the uh, manufacturer is X and you just follow it. So it shouldn't be any problem. But what if something that you have no idea, the extent of the weight? Okay. So again, it depends on what you want to study or investigate. There is no such thing as your boundary needs to be ABC. Your uh, domain needs to be uh, this big okay, uh, for CFD. It depends on the particular problem or what you want to study. Okay, for example, uh, when you have an object like this, okay, this goes back to the example just now, uh, you want to look at the flow passing through a circle, the separation point. Okay, basically, you have a flow. You want to look at the separation point over here. 
Okay. So in this particular case, your boundary shouldn't be that big. Maybe all you want to do is something like this because you just want to look at the area of interest around here. The, uh, the separation point is not uh, a large area. It's a very, very small area. So you just focus for this is the, your area of interest. So your domain should be uh, slightly this big, roughly. Okay. What if, for example, you are investing a spray concentration in combustion chamber? Again, it depends on the spec that you have. We know that combustion chamber pretty much fixed. We know, for example, if you have um, a 5,000 cc, so you can calculate the volume and you can know, for example, your dimension of the chamber. So this will be your domain. Okay. So you can see that uh, the flow basically uh, reaches the bottom of the combustor chamber. So you will have a concentration over here. Okay. But what if, uh, okay, for example, uh, let's say, uh, let's see another example. Uh, this is uh, for my FYP student. If you want to model spray characteristic for food cutting industry, meaning that uh, you want to check basically how far can the flow uh, goes, basically the, the flow travels, basically you want to check the distance that it can travel by uh, the specification given by the industry. For example, we know that the pressure or the velocity uh, of the nozzle. And we want to check whether, let's say, if we put food over here, let's say watermelon, will the jet be able to reach the watermelon and cut it? So that's the purpose. So if that's the purpose, then you know that your watermelon roughly should be this size. So you just want to make an educated guess. Okay, I my domain or the length of my domain should just be this big. And my width should be this big just to see uh, the flow or the spray pattern basically. Okay. In this case, okay, for example, this is my area of interest. Just now, we just look at, for example, one object. And after we have a flow passing through, we have the weight. We want to see the weight going throughout uh, of the domain. But what happens if you have multiple objects? Okay. So from the fluid dynamics of conservation, conservation of momentum and continuity equation, as you have a more body at the back, what we'll have is, what you are going to encounter is a velocity deficit because the weight cannot recover quick enough. Hence, it will pass through the second row, proceed to the third, fourth, and so on and so forth. Hence, your weight will accumulate at the back here. Okay, now, if our interest is to look at how far can the weight go or can the weight be generated by a set of objects, let's say we have 3, 6, 12, uh, we have let's say 15, uh, let's say we have 15 cylinders over here. If we have 15 cylinders, how far can the weight uh, go or how far or how big can the weight uh, be generated from this problem? So, for example, if you just draw your domain up until this point, then you know your, uh, you got it wrong because there is still weight at the back. Okay? And it doesn't fulfill our objective, which is to look at the extent of the weight generated. So, in this particular case, the student needs to uh, set the length of the domain to be, I think this is 800 meter for an object with 5 meter diameter. Okay, so 800 meters. Okay, previously, uh, that particular student, I think, uh, just set the length of the domain to be, I think, 500. And we notice when we set the five uh, the domain to be 500 meter, we see that the weight touches the outlet, which is not what we want because we want to look at the extent of the weight. Okay, so we have to uh, increase the length of the domain to be up until 
800 meters at the back. Okay. So again, it depends on on the problem. If you want to look at the uh, aerodynamics of a car, most probably you just need to have the domain big enough so that the flow can go out because you just want to focus at the area of the car. You just want to look at the windshield uh, and the top of the car and maybe at the back, at the bonnet. Okay, you don't need uh, such a large uh, or uh, large domain like this because you're not interested to see how far can the weight be generated at the back. Okay, you just want to see, for example, the mixing or the turbulence, the drag happening on the design of the, the car. Okay, so it depends on the problem, right? Okay, uh, so again, this reflects uh, to the, the fundamental uh, question, which is how far do you want your uh, domain? Uh, it depends on the space. So for example, this is the work that we did during PKP, uh, part of my work uh, with Dr. Shariman, where we were uh, requested by Bomba uh, to produce uh, a device uh, to basically speed up the process eh? because previously before we before we have this device uh, it has to be done manually meaning that uh, personnel from bomba kkm they need to spray or disinfect uh, the the walls um, of the the facilities or the premises it has to be done manually so the bomba basically requested for us to design uh, a device that can speed up, speed up the process uh, and also can be basically mounted on the car as well as uh, push manually. Okay, so this is Dr. Shariman's project. So, but for my part, Dr. Shariman basically asked for help to verify whether the spec, the pressure, uh, the input that they use uh, for this particular device met the requirement by, uh, by the bomber. So basically, the requirement by bomber at that particular time was that the spray must reach the wall at least three meters uh, in length. So, meaning that the spray needs to travel at least three meter in all direction, in all of these directions. Okay, to, so to verify that, I create a domain. Okay, this is basically uh, with the help of my FYP student last semester, uh, last year. Okay, so with the help of uh, students, basically we verify that based on the input and also the size of the blower here, we, we can meet the requirement set by Bomba, which is the minimum of three meter to the top and also at all directions, basically. Okay. So that's how we use fluid dynamics to verify the design by Dr. Shariman. So again, it depends on what you want to study. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is about the separation point we covered briefly. Okay, uh, so again, we covered about uh, the Von uh, von Karman uh, uh, Vortex. Uh, we are going to discuss in detail uh, when we uh, start the turbulence modeling uh, lecture. Okay, so uh, for fluid dynamics, a Von Karman Vortex basically is a repeating pattern of a swirling vortices causing by a process known as vortex shredding, which is responsible for the unsteady separation of flow of fluid around a blonde body. So if you have a, an object, something like this, okay, this is the von Karman for phenomena. Okay, this is experimental. Okay, so that's how you verify your model. And this is simulation, of course. Okay, now, the question that student might ask, okay, uh, this is a real phenomena. Basically, I think this is uh, the von Karman strip caused by the wind flowing around the Juan Fernandez Islands. Okay, so this is the real phenomena observed on, uh, from the satellite. Okay. But if you look here, I think this is interesting. If you look from the simulation produced here, it produced a very, very nice vortex that resembled von Karman, the expected output. Okay. This is quite similar to what we have over here. Is it this now? This is quite similar to what we have. Okay, of course, this we have several devices, but now we have drawn a blind body. But right? why don't we observe the von Karman phenomena? Can anyone 
provide an educated guess? Why can't we observe von Karman phenomena for this particular problem? Anyone? Anyone? Those who give a correct answer, I'll give extra mark. Uh, maybe for the test or maybe for the assignment. Or maybe for the case study. Anyone can give an educated guess? First come, first serve. Why can't we observe the von Karman uh, phenomena for this particular problem? Anyone? Maybe because it has enough velocity. Not enough velocity. That's a good guess. Thank you. But not quite. Thank you, Ashiko. The letter flow is too short to be developed when blocked by letter objects. Uh, not quite. Uh, I'll show you later. Um, basically, we have uh, do we have something similar? Uh, no. Oh no. Sorry. Say one more time. Uh, not quite so because even with one object, it should give something like this. Uh, quite similar to what we have over here. So we still do not observe von Karman. Okay, anyone else can give an educated guess? Thank you, Ashikul and Sue for trying. Anyone else for bonus mark? Okay. Is it related to pressure, low pressure. No, effect. no, but good try. It's not related to pressure. It's not about um, the flow is too short or maybe one object. From Teva, no turbulence flow at wake. You got you got it partially correct. It's related to turbulence, but not because no turbulence. Over here, turbulence is happening, Teva. There is a turbulence happening. That's why you get a blue region, velocity deficit. Remember, the red one means higher velocity. A green one means a uh, slower velocity, but still higher than blue. Blue is the lowest, maybe. 0 or 0 0.1. Okay, this is 1 meter per second. So because of turbulence, then we have velocity deficit. So it's regarding turbulence, but not because of not turbulence. Because okay. of the boundaries? No, not because of the boundaries. <laughs> but good try. Okay, I think uh, so. Okay, another one. Uh, Amir, shear between the boundaries. No, it's not about the boundaries. Um, no continuous turbulence is not about continuous turbulence, but the turbulence term is related. Yes, redox number not quite. Yes, it's regarding turbulence, but it's not about redox. Okay, eh? Boleh, eh? Uh, surrender everyone. Okay, the reason why uh, we did not observe the von Karman uh, phenomena of vortex on this particular output. Is because anyone remember what runs is Renox average Navier Stoke, and compared to this, I'm pretty sure they are using either LES or ENS. This is what we are going to cover in turbulence modeling. So what it means is basically, so if we have runs over here, runs means Renox average Navier Stoke, okay, which is what uh, is being used on ANSYS. Runs, Renox average. Average means the turbulence that is happening behind here, which is the weight basically, is not being replicated or being solved individually at each point. Instead, they are taking average value. So, for example, okay, so for example, I'll give you one example. Let's say this is the turbulence uh, fluctuation that is happening. Okay, this is time, this is the velocity value. Okay, if we are using LES or DNS, LES stands for large edge simulations. Don't worry, we are going to cover later. DNS, direct numerical simulations, they will calculate at individual time time step, the values that is happening at each uh, node. 
But for us, instead of the fluctuation over here, we are going to take an average value, something like this. Because of the average value, we cannot have the details, shapes, or nice contour as produced over here. That's how, that's why we get shapes, something like this. It is because of the turbulence model that cannot be solved or the turbulence property is not solved properly. Uh, so good, good, uh, good try everyone. Okay, but I think uh, it's fair to say that no one deserves the bonus uh, points today. Okay. Uh, I plan to finish everything hopefully by today, but it doesn't seem possible. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think we have not much left. Uh, quickly, I'm going to share one more time. Oh, sorry. We have just a few more slides to finish uh, regarding this uh, session. So hopefully we can cover next week and next week. I think we are going to start with the uh, before FDM, which is the uh, derivation of the Navier Stokes. We are going to look at how we arrive at the momentum equations and uh, also the continuity equations. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Um, have a good day, everyone. I'll see you in the next session. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.